My name is David Burt. I'm an immunologist. And for the last 30 years, I've been working in vaccine research and development, developing vaccines against infectious diseases. Today, I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19 vaccines. At the moment, we have a number of vaccines that have been developed and approved for use against COVID-19. If you think back a year ago, when the pandemic was just starting, who would believe that in less than a year we'd have vaccines against COVID-19? Vaccines that were developed, approved, and also used throughout the world. At the moment, there are about 200 vaccines in development at various stages of COVID-19. Some of them have been authorized and 130 million doses of these vaccines have been given around the world. Now, to many people, this is a miracle of scientific endeavor. For others, they're more cautious. Is it possible that a vaccine can be developed so rapidly? And so a number of individuals are very cautious about taking the vaccine and have a sort of wait and see approach to whether they're going to take the vaccine or not. So today, I want to give you some information about the COVID vaccines that have been approved. And I hope that this will help you to make an informed decision about these vaccines. So we're going to cover how the vaccines have been developed, their mode of action, what's actually in the vaccines, and are the vaccines safe and effective? I like this slide because it's a metaphor for the situation that we're in at the moment. And it tells us about where vaccines sit in our arsenal against the pandemic. This metaphor uses cheese slices to represent the various layers of protection that we are asked to follow in order to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. And you notice that the, um, the slide shows you a number of layers and the cheese layers represent things like wearing a mask, um, social distancing, we're talking about um, government messaging, we're talking about washing hands carefully, and we're talking about vaccines. Now, you notice that Swiss cheese slices are being used in this, um, this metaphor. Swiss cheese has holes in it. And what this represents is that individually, each of these layers of protection have holes, they have defects. So if you don't wear a mask properly, then you're not going to be protected enough from the vaccine, from the virus, sorry. However, if we use and combine all of these layers of protective um, methods together, then we'll have a significant impact in terms of protecting us against the, the virus and also protecting others because we won't be transmitting the virus. Now, vaccines play an important role in this um, arsenal of um, methods that we have because vaccines are thought to be the last um, piece of the puzzle that will enable us to get back to something close to normal activities in, in, in society. Vaccines will induce immunity in individuals who take the vaccine and if enough individuals have um, immunity and what we call herd immunity then we'll be able to um, ensure that the virus has very limited um, um, way of actually transmitting through the community because most people will be immune. So, why vaccines? Well, vaccines have been shown over decades to be very effective. Vaccines work. And if you look at this slide, you'll see a number of diseases that were causing significant health problems to individuals prior to the, the age of vaccination. And you notice after vaccines were developed against many of these diseases like um, measles, like polio, um, pertussis, 
the incidence and the numbers of individuals in Canada that actually had these diseases dropped down from between 50 and 90, 99%. Vaccines work and vaccines are an important tool in our arsenal to combat this disease, um, COVID-19. And in fact, we've been told from the WHO that apart from the provision of clean water, vaccines have had more profound effects on world health, especially of children, than any other public health measure. So let's talk about how these vaccines against COVID-19 have been developed. As I said, there are over 200 vaccines against COVID-19 in various stages of development. And two have been authorized for use, emergency use in Canada and the US, and two others are about to be authorized in our, in our jurisdiction. The vaccines that you're probably aware of are the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and soon to be authorized will be the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Now, a lot of individuals feel that these vaccines have been developed too rapidly in order for them to be safe. Well, as far back as 1997, researchers were looking at the possibility of using DNA and RNA vaccines um, to treat disease and to prevent disease. And this um, manuscript on the slide is from 1997, and it's talking about um, a prototype DNA vaccine that was being developed and shown to be effective um, in terms of producing an immune response and protecting animals against measles. Also recently, Time magazine featured this husband and wife team from the company BioNTech. BioNTech is a company that developed the mRNA vaccine that Pfizer is actually using. This husband and wife team, Dr. Sehan and Dr. Tereshi, um, started this company in 2008. But Dr. Tereshi has been working on messenger RNA as a potential vaccine and as a potential treatment for cancer since 1997. So a lot of the work has been done trying to um, develop these technologies and also trying to perfect them. In addition, in 2002 and 2012, we first saw similar coronaviruses to the one that um, is, is responsible for COVID-19. Um, the SARS virus and the M Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. And many researchers have been working on developing vaccines for these viruses all the way back from, to 2002 and 2012. And on this slide, you can see um, two researchers from the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Kizzy Corbett and Dr. Barney Graham. And these individuals have been working on the MERS vaccine. Unfortunately, a lot of companies that were working on SARS and MERS stopped their work when these viruses disappeared. But a lot of academic groups, including this one, continued their work and were able to show that they could use a certain protein on the sur surface of the MERS um, virus to develop a vaccine. The protein is the S protein, and this is the same protein that is a target of um, the immune system against the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. This group did some pioneering work on the S protein of the MERS coronavirus, which is totally applicable to the COVID-19 virus. And this protein, the S protein, it is the basis of most of the vaccines that are in development against COVID-19. And this team, four or five years ago, did the groundwork that is being applied to COVID-19 vaccines. So if we look at the development path of a vaccine, we, we can see that there's a preclinical phase where vaccines are tested in animals. They're, they're looking for the ability of the vaccines to induce an immune response and to be safe. And then 
they move into clinical testing where they're tested in humans, initially in phase one, small numbers of humans just to make sure that the vaccine is safe, moving to phase two where maybe hundreds of individuals are tested um, to see if there's an immune response and into larger numbers of thousands of individuals in phase three to see whether the vaccine can protect against disease. And following phase three, the vaccine after it's been launched is monitored for a number of years to look for any um, rare events that might um, indicate some safety issue. Now, because of the work that's already been done in relation to other co coronaviruses, the preclinical phase of the work for COVID has been very rapid because most of the work has already been done with SARS and MERS. And so it's only a few experiments were needed to be done to um, translate that work into the COVID-19 vaccine. And because of that knowledge, the regulatory authorities have enabled that work that new work in animals to be done um, in parallel with phase one studies in humans. And in addition, because of the emerging um, necessity to get a vaccine rapidly, um, the regulatory authorities have enabled the researchers to combine phase one and phase, three, phase two, sorry, and phase three of the vaccine development program so that we can move this vaccine program along in terms of development to tackle this pandemic. And that has been done without compromising any safety. Most of the vaccines that we actually use today, there's a critical um, safety window in which researchers and regulatory authorities want to make sure that the vaccine is safe. And this is a 60 day window after the vaccine has been given in these trials. Most of the vaccines that we've had in the past have had to pass this 60 day window where they show no serious adverse effects. And these new COVID vaccines have had to pass this criteria as well. So how do these vaccines work? Well, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 has certain spike proteins. These are in orange or yellow on the screen. These proteins interact with receptors, ACE2 receptors on the sur surface of cells in the respiratory tract and in fact all over the body. And the idea for a vaccine is to de develop antibodies against this surface protein so that it prevents the protein from interacting or docking with its receptor because that's how the virus gets into the cell and infects the cell. There are numerous types of coronaviruses, um, vaccines that are in development. Um, on the right of the screen, you can see a, a whole virus. And this is a typical way of making a, a vaccine, a traditional way where the, the virus is inactivated. Um, so it doesn't cause disease, but it can induce an immune response. Then we have proteins from the surface of the virus, like um, influenza antigen or hepatitis B antigen. This is a type of protein vaccine um, and the protein represents the, the protein on the surface of the, um, the virus. The protein is purified and used as a vaccine and sometimes the proteins can assemble themselves spontaneously into what we call virus-like particles or instead of giving the actual protein or the um, attenuated virus as a vaccine, we can give the body the actual code or the message so that the body itself can make that protein, the immune system will say, ah, this is foreign. And then the immune system will make um, antibodies and generate T cells and other immune effector molecules against the virus. And the, vi the vaccines that have been approved up to this point are RNA and DNA vaccines. And they have been approved because they can be produced rapidly. For the other types of vaccines, the vaccine manufacturers have to make um, new manufacturing facilities and extensive um, work and time to, to grow the virus or to make the protein. But with these vaccines, 
the RNA and DNA vaccines, our cells are actually the manufacturing plants. And so a whole um, component of the vaccine development process has been bypassed by using RNA and DNA vaccines. Now in our cells, the two major components in our cell, in our particular cell, there's the, the main part of the cell, it's called the cytosol, and then there's the nucleus. DNA is found in the nucleus of our cells, in our chromosomes. And when our bodies want to make a protein, they go to DNA and they look at the large database of um, recipes, if you like, to make various proteins. That, what's, that's what DNA is. It has the code, the recipe for the various proteins that we need our bodies to, to use. And you can see, think of DNA as a type of um, read-only file on a computer. So it doesn't do anything, but it's, 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 it, it has all the information there. So if the body wants to make a protein, it will create a photocopy, if you like, called messenger RNA of the part of the DNA that encodes for the protein that the cell wants to make. This happens outside of the nucleus and the cell machinery will translate that code into the protein that's needed to be made. Now, DNA is being used as one of the vaccines and if you look on the screen, you'll see that um, the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines are using DNA as the vaccine. The recently approved um, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are based on RNA. And both of them eventually will enable the cells to make the protein, the S protein, that is the component, the most important component of the, of the, of the vaccine eventually. So basically, if you look at the um, Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, the RNA is actually put into a lipid like a fatty vesicle to protect it. And then that's given to our bodies. Uh, our cells will see the RNA, make the protein from it. The protein will be released into the body and our immune system will recognize this as being foreign and generate an immune response to it. Um, the DNA vaccines are slightly different because the DNA needs to get into the nucleus compartment of the cell. And to do this, you need to be able to transport the um, DNA into the nucleus. And this is done by utilizing um, transport viruses. And in this case, adenovirus, either a chimp or a human adenovirus, which normally c causes a common cold, but in this situation, they've modified the virus so it doesn't cause disease, but it can get the DNA into the nucleus. The DNA goes to the nucleus and our mechanisms for um, making protein convert that DNA into RNA in the cytosol outside of the nucleus. And again, the protein, S protein is made and our body's immune system responds to it. So that when the real virus comes along now, these cells which produce the antibodies and these T cells, they actually have a memory and they, they're sitting there and they, they've been taught to recognize this protein on the surface of the virus. And when we are infected, we can mount a strong immune response against the virus. So what's in the vaccine? Well, the vaccine is a very simple um, very simple mix of substances. You have the, the RNA in the case of um, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. And you also have these lipid vesicles that the RNA is in. Lipid is just like a fat, fatty vesicle. RNA is very labile. It's, it's, it's not very stable, so it has to be protected. And these lipid fatty vesicles, which are microscopic, they protect the, the RNA so they can get to the cells without being destroyed. And these lipids, these fatty lipids, are very sensitive to temperature. And because these vaccines have to be stored at very low temperatures, the vaccine also has sugar, in this case sucrose, which protects the fatty um, layers um, surrounding the messenger RNA. And finally, 
we have salts. And these salts are there to make sure that the, the composition, the salt composition of the vaccine is similar to the salt composition in our bodies. And sometimes we think of this as in terms of pH. So these vaccines are very, very simple. The um, DNA vaccines are even simpler because you, there you've just got the, um, the, the transport virus, the adenovirus in a very simple solution. And you notice these vaccines they don't have um, any electromagnetic particles that you often hear about. They don't have substances that can cause infertility. They're nanoparticles, but there's nothing strange about a nanoparticle. It just refers to the size of the, the particle, the, the lipid fatty particle that the RNA is in, which is 10 to the minus 9 meters, which is a very microscopic size. So these vaccines are very simple. Let's go back now and look at the efficacy of these vaccines. How effective are they? Now, this is a busy slide, but it has a lot of information that's really important. And it shows and compares the, the vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. And as you can see, over 30,000 individuals were enrolled in these, um, these vaccine trials. And some of the um, studies were done in different parts of the world to make sure that different ethnicities were um, involved in the studies. And for instance, um, in the Moderna and the Pfizer studies, 10% of the participants were black, 25% were Hispanic, um, about 10%, 5 to 10% Asian, and the rest were Caucasian. These vaccines um, were tested, and these vaccine studies are still ongoing because the approval of these vaccines is based on interim data. The pandemic, because of this, its, uh, um, its severity, um, regulatory authorities have required that sufficient data is generated, although the study isn't finished, but sufficient data is generated to show that these vaccines are effective and safe. And these vaccines have been shown to be around 95% effective. And that is 95% of the individuals who take these um, vaccines did not have mild or severe COVID disease. And this was disease that was confirmed by um, laboratory testing. So these vaccines are extremely, extremely effective. And there are a number of vaccines that are in development, as I said, and some in other parts of the world but all of the vaccines have had at least 50% um, protective efficacy. Um, and most of them between 70 and 95% effective. Now, when the um, regulatory authorities were um, deciding what level of efficacy would they want to see in a vaccine for COVID, they were asking for at least 50% efficacy. And as you can see, most of the vaccines are um, above that threshold. So these vaccines are very, very effective. And in addition to the clinical trial data, we also have data from um, the real um, live use of these vaccines in the community. And one of the areas that has really rolled out the vaccine rapidly and effectively is Israel. 61% of their 9 million individuals have at least received one dose of the vaccine. This is a Pfizer vaccine. And studies have shown in real use of these vaccines that this vaccine is 92% effective in the community, looking at um, hundreds of thousands of individuals in real life use, which matches the efficacy that was shown in the clinical studies. So these vaccines are very effective. Now let's look at the safety. This slide shows typical safety profile for um, following the Pfizer or during the Pfizer vaccine trial. And most of the side effects that were seen, and really the side effects are adverse events in, in, in science, adverse events, are typical of what you see when you're vaccinated against flu or shingles 
or other vaccines that we normally take. So some individuals get headaches, um, fever, um, pain at the site of, of the reaction, sometimes um, some joint problems, but these usually disappear after hours or after a few days. And if you look at the um, Pfizer vaccine in terms of the reactogenicity compared to other vaccines, it's probably more reactive in terms of these side effects than influenza, but less so um, than the shingles vaccine. And you can see even the placebo causes effects at the site of immunization. So these vaccines are as safe and typically give you the same types of adverse events that you'd see with regular vaccines. Now, what about more serious um, events or reactions after getting the vaccine? On this slide, you'll see that um, data from real life use of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in the US. And this data was assembled after 2 million doses of Pfizer and 4 million doses of Moderna vaccine were distributed and administered in the US. And the rate of severe adverse events, as you can see, were very rare. The rate was very low. And these were mainly anaphylactic or allergic reactions that you've probably heard about in the media. And in terms of a million doses, for the Pfizer vaccine, we find that only about 10 individuals per 1,000, sorry, 1 million um, doses of the vaccine actually saw these rare anaphylactic allergic responses. It was even less in terms of the Moderna vaccine where two and a half persons per million saw these severe adverse reactions a little bit higher than what you'd see with influenza. But you have to remember these reactions, these allergies can be treated on the spot. That's why we're asked to stay around for 15 or, or 30 minutes after getting a, even a regular flu vaccine. So these reactions are very, very rare. And if you look at these reactions in relation to the risk of getting COVID, and this is again US data, nearly one in 12 Americans have been tested positive for COVID-19. One in 12. Now, most of these individuals will have mild disease or they'll be asymptomatic. But we know that even in these populations, later on, there could be long lasting effects in terms of lung function and, and cardiac problems. But what's really surprising and daunting is the fact that one in a thousand Americans have died as a result of COVID-19. One in a thousand. And when you compare that with the um, risk of getting a rare um, side reaction that can be treated or that can disappear after a few days, the risk benefit ratio is very clear. The benefits of these vaccines more than outweigh the risks. And this is the reason why these vaccines have been approved for emergency use by regulatory authorities all over the world. Now, just to close, um, my goal isn't really to tell you that you need to take the vaccine, but I hope that from this presentation, you've had enough information to enable you to make an informed decision about whether you should take the vaccine or not. And most faith groups agree that vaccination is part of making sure that we have healthy um, bodies. And including our own group as Seventh-day Adventists, we have um, an immunization um, document that talks about the role of immunization in terms of how the church sees it. And I think it's a very, um, it's a very balanced document because it, it emphasizes that immunization, just like living a healthy lifestyle and following the biblical principles, is part of the way that we're going to stay healthy. And the other part that I like about this is that 
it also reflects our values as Christians. Philippines 2, 3 and 4 tells us that we shouldn't only look out for ourselves and our own interests, but take an interest in others. And we should use our freedoms to serve one another in love. And the idea of vaccination is an idea that, yes, it's telling us that we need to protect ourselves, but it also reflects our duty to the community in terms of herd immunity. I hope this has clarified a number of issues and questions that you may have about the vaccine. And I hope that you'll be able to make an informed decision about the vaccine in the future. Thank you.